appreciate that. And uh, of course, it's an honor to be here to, to talk to you, everybody and to answer your questions at the end of my little speech that I have written down and not committed to memory because if I try to do anything from memory these days, I'd hold you hostage here all day long because I'm trying to remember uh, what I want to say. So I will read you some things and uh, then, uh, then let's, uh, let's uh, engage in a question and answer session after that. Um, So as you know, uh, Lee has a very distinguished uh, pedigree with regard to journalism, and so therefore you all are served very, very well by uh, this professor who has a, uh, a distinguished career in film production, as well as being a uh, first-rate uh, professor here at the university. Uh, this is uh, the university that I was graduating from, and back then they called it Morris Harvey College, but it's still home to me, and I really uh, appreciate coming back here to the campus to, from time to time to, to uh, see old friends and to talk with young people uh, these days. And, and it's a reminder of how, how old I am because of how young you are. Uh, so this, I understand, is a class, COM 302, class in digital video production, but some of you are from some other classes that uh, Lee has. And, and I, in that sense, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, digital video production today and the differences between how it is today and, and the old technologies that we used back when I first started out, when I was your, your age, I first started out in broadcasting. And so I'm going to uh, talk about things in the past and who better than uh, to talk about the past than, than an old man? I'm uh, mindful that uh, uh, in talking about the past, uh, you may or may not have any interest in that, but because uh, it is said that the only thing, the only person who really had any interest in what grandma had was grandpa. And so, that's a laugh on <laughs> Anyway, I hope I interest you with this. Back um, after the middle of the last century, I covered the war in Vietnam for CBS. That's back in 1970 and 71. I was there for 13 months. And the way we did it then was to go into the field with a film camera, 16 millimeter film, and go out into the field to shoot stories about the battles that were taking place there and how to show how uh, young men and women, American men and women, were being killed in that terrible war. Uh, the thing you may not know is that if it rained then, the humidity was so high that uh, we couldn't use the cameras and couldn't do the stories because the film, 16 millimeter film, would turn to mush in the camera. And so therefore, uh, I'll be able to say, oh, went away. Uh, so therefore, we were, we were uh, handicapped to a certain extent by not having the kinds of technologies that you have today in which uh, the weather doesn't make any difference. And uh, uh, there is another factor here as well, and that is that you can shoot something immediately and it goes on the air immediately so that there isn't any lapse in time. When we shot film out in the field in Vietnam, you had to get it on a helicopter to film in a canister can, had it moved back to Saigon, which uh, could take some days or even a week to do that, and then it had to be shipped from Saigon, the film did, to uh, the West Coast, to California, where it was then taken off the airplane, taken to the studio, processed in a chemical bath, and, and then uh, the film was readable, and then uh, it was edited there. And then from there, it had to be sent to uh, New York, uh, by landline, not by satellite, because there were no satellites at the time, and uh, taken in in New York on two-inch videotape, and then preserved for broadcast perhaps that evening or another evening. So 
it wasn't exactly, you know, a technology that lent itself to the uh, idea of getting stuff on the air right away, as you can, and as people expect you to. It's just taken for granted today, but uh, the, the stories that we did in the field took uh, a very long time to get to the viewer. And uh, while the viewer, while it was America's first uh, living room war, which is to say people uh, were able to see this stuff on television and, and it had an impact, it didn't have, I think, quite the impact that that you, you have today with the modern technology in which you can actually show what's going on at any given moment, moment in real time to the viewer. The viewer just takes that as a, as a given. But that's really something special. And if we had had that kind of technology in the field in Vietnam at that time, we would have considered it to be a miracle because those things just didn't, didn't happen that quickly at that time. But we were moving forward. So, um, if you think about that and think about uh, shipping the film and thinking about having to uh, depend on uh, a lot of other people to, to get a story on the air, you, um, you realize how, how significant what you have achieved or what we have achieved in terms of development of technology is so uh, monumental, so paramount. In fact, I remember times when we were out in the field in Vietnam and your competitors were out there with you, of course, doing the same story. So I was with CBS and maybe another camera crew and a reporter was from ABC, another one from NBC. And those were the three major networks that, that were covering the war and covering everything else in the world at the time. And that's those, we got our information at that time through only those three fountains of information uh, for television. Now you have cable, you have the internet, you have numerous uh, forms of, uh, of the, the voices in terms of your, what you get on, uh, it, as far as information is concerned. So because it was such a competitive business then as it is now, uh, sometimes uh, we would do, I wouldn't do it of course, but some, some uh, competitors, somebody competing with me or others would uh, be responsible for getting film back to Saigon and they might throw it out the helicopter door your film, that is, not mine, and and, uh, and so they were very competitive and very, sometimes dishonest. Now you don't have to worry about that because you just feed it directly from wherever you are. Um, I think that um, uh, that um, another issue that we have to think about is that with the modern day technology, the, that places a greater burden on uh, military brass who are responsible for what you do out in the field and in terms of a combat situation. If you are out there and the military have to, uh, have to be responsible for you and have to control what you're doing, and they do it, they, they do control what you do in many ways because they have control over your movement, they have control over logistics, they have it, look, uh, this new technology places greater burden on them because of uh, because you are able to outmaneuver them, if you will, to a great extent by being able to have instantaneous access to uh, television viewers. I mean, these uh, these little phones that you have now are amazing and very powerful in the sense that they have turned individuals like you into uh, the same thing as big broadcast institutions because you have, with it, it, your ability to, to use these things, means that you can take pictures of something that's going on, and we've all seen this recently in, in terms of the Arab uh, Spring. Uh, entire governments are, are overthrown because of images uh, taken by these little cameras in these little devices and transmitted immediately all over the world. That was unheard of. Uh, you know, 40 or 50 years ago when I started out in this business. Well, uh, let's just say that uh, the technological advantages that we take for granted today have been the stuff of miracles to us in the, in the trenches back then. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, the things that uh, uh, 
the iPhone moments involve. And that is um, the nature of what we are seeing uh, can be misinterpreted by the viewer. Because if because there's only a certain amount of visual material that is presented to the viewer, and the viewer has to make decisions based on what he or she is seeing at any given time. He, and you don't know whether just outside the frame of the video that you are seeing, what other thing may be going on or action may be going on that would change your opinion about uh, what you're seeing. In other words, if there were a director outside of the frame of film directing action within the film, and you didn't see the director, or what, and you weren't known about his presence or her presence, then, uh, then you might interpret what you're seeing in a specific way. If you knew about the director and so on, you'd interpret it differently because you would know that there is another aspect to, to what you're, you're doing. So it's a danger, and it's a big danger in terms of, of uh, the use of this uh, video. It can be misleading and it can be confusing to a lot of viewers. Uh, now, if a reporter, um, when I when I started out, we used to be forced by the nature of the technology to go out into the field and actually witness a story that is going on or was going on. Uh, actually witness it and take pictures of it and come back and report about that, about what we had we the reporter had seen. Today, and, and that's a very expensive proposition, by the way, going out, taking an airplane to some place, getting off the airplane, going out in the field, uh, staying at hotels, uh, renting a Learjet, which we used to do frequently. Uh, that's very expensive stuff. Today, it is inexpensive for a reporter to sit back in a control room someplace and receive material or images via satellite and then synthesize the material he has, or she has, and make a television program out of it. That's bad business because you don't know, you can't authenticate the video that you're seeing. You can't validate it in any way. The only way you know, you, or you think you know, uh, what, is, what has occurred on the video or the images is by somebody else telling you that that's what it is. But you can't be sure, you can't be certain of that. And that's, um, that can be, uh, terribly dangerous, especially if you put something on the air that is um, considered to be uh, one thing, and then somebody throws you into court and sues you for millions of dollars because, in fact, the image was something else that wronged the plaintiff who's bringing you to court, you're in serious trouble. So that's a, a real problem today. A lot of the images that you see uh, on television these days the reporter who's reporting it to you never had the experience of knowing what it is that he's trying to tell you about. It's a very inexpensive way to do business, and that's why the television networks and broadcasters and the internet and CNN and Fox News and so on, they use that method. But you ha it has to be suspect. You have to be very careful with that kind of business. The other thing about that is uh, that what has happened as a result of either the desire not to go into the field, not to go, actually go out and report the stories in person. It's led to the uh, anchor people going on the air and telling you about something that has happened, or a pundit going on the air, on camera, a talking head, telling you about something that has happened. And I call that um, the uh, yammering syndrome. In other words, you've got a lot of people getting on the air these days and yammering about something that they may not know anything about. And so what has happened is the because of the advent of the yammering talking head, uh, people don't read, they get a distorted view of whatever the story may be. Because it is the view of that talking head, you have to trust in the talking head in order to get uh, any good information. Well, you can't be always trustful that the talking head is not going to have another agenda in presenting the information that, that he has other than the truth. So be very careful uh, with that kind of thing. It's, 
the yammering syndrome is pervasive these days in the, especially in the cable networks, 20, 24 hour a day uh, information patterns uh, in which they have to keep the news going in a 24 hour cycle all the time and they rely uh, incredibly on uh, people who are bringing the information to them simply by telling them what has happened as opposed to going to the scene of what happened and reporting it themselves and authenticating that material. Uh, and that, I think, leads us to the, the nature of, uh, of the business these days in terms of its competitiveness. When I first started out um, uh, in this uh, business, uh, to get a job, you didn't have to, uh, it did, did not depend on good looks alone. It depended on brains. And today, it, this has become a very cosmetic industry in which uh, uh, the reporter has to be young. For the most part, they have to be young. And they have to be uh, good looking. And they have to appeal to uh, the audience's desire to look at uh, eye candy as opposed to trying to get at, uh, at what may be. Now, uh, many of the reporters today are both attractive and hardworking. Don't, don't get me wrong. But if you're going out there to try to get a job these days, uh, you're you have a foot up, you're ahead of the game if you happen to be uh, blonde and blue-eyed and, uh, and you're able to uh, bat your baby blues in order to get the, uh, the job that you want. It's just as simple as that. Uh, Bridget was telling me when she was in, in, uh, the, on the air in, uh, in a station in the northern part of the state that uh, they, um, they, the, her superiors were adamant that she have uh, wear a certain kind of lipstick, have her hair cut a certain way, wear certain kinds of clothing that um, they consider to be. And those were the important things. Those were the paramount things in the management's view. And the news was secondary. So it is a, it's a shame about what has happened. But um, uh, I, I know that I was a George Clooney lookalike. But gosh, uh, I also remember. Can I interject? Yeah. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with on-air guidelines. Have you all seen any type of document, legal document, like that on-air guidelines? Um, on-air guidelines vary from station to station, and it depends on you know which company you're with, Cox Media or whoever. Um, we also um, are in unions, broadcast journalists, um, and anyone really who's a media personality. But on-air guidelines, um, as I mentioned, do vary from station to station, but your news director has total say over your image, and he can, they can um, sell your image, and that's the contract that you sign, and it's a non-compete, and there's a lot of different um, legal logistics involved, but um, it, it's real, and, and as um, Ed said, I mean, the news, I mean, you always want to be a great reporter, but now there is a strong emphasis on just presentation, and it, you're really at the, um, you know, at the, uh, at the decision of, of your news director as far as um, they may say, girls, you can't wear blouses. You have to wear a suit every single day on air. Whereas some stations, you know, I know that some of those girl sensations, that may not be um, the case um, as far as wardrobe. Um, your hair, they have uh, a lot of um, the news director stations, they have stylists, and you have to go to that particular stylist. And if your hair is even fixed a certain way on camera, and you're having a live shot out there, um, it's in the wind, and maybe your hair's pulled back, I mean, you, and they don't like it, they will tell you that. I mean, so it is very, very competitive down to a T um, as far as what makeup you wear, um, what your hair color is, what, um, you know, how it's styled and so forth. And so uh, you may know some of those on-air guidelines. And again, it varies, um, it, some of which depends on what market, but that's something for you to keep in mind. Uh, is, is that something that, you know, I want to do? And maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but just things to be thinking about. Thank you, Bridget. Appreciate Sorry. That. Um, but you got to know that the uh, behind the cameras, behind the camera jobs are not necessarily that easy to come by, but uh, they are behind the camera. And 
Brian Williams makes multi millions of dollars a year, and the people behind the cameras, the producers, the camera people, and so on, don't make uh, a tenth of, of what he earns. So just uh, that's why those jobs <coughs> that involve uh, cosmetics are so valuable because they mean ratings for for the um, for the television stations or the cable systems and so on. And that's why they go for uh, how the, why the stations and the news directors uh, go for people who will appear uh, to be attractive to the viewer as opposed to uh, looking to one's uh, intelligence and one's ability to gather news as the primary uh, focus. So that brings me to uh, another issue that I think you want to be interested in, and that is uh, uh, how to conduct an interview. Interviews are really terribly important in uh, this business if you are truly uh, uh, anchored to and, uh, and, and want to do a good job as, as a reporter. Uh, being able to conduct an interview is is uh, not a simple thing. It may seem simple and at the outset. All you have to do, you think, is just simply ask some questions. But as Hemingway said, the writer or the author or the reporter has to know everything. I mean, <coughs> you've got to be steeped in uh, knowledge of what is going on, generally speaking, and with regard to a specific interview, you have to do uh, an incredible amount of research to be sure that you are hoodwinked by the person you're interviewing, number one. You can catch him or her in a lie if in the interview uh, you're trying to get it true. And you have to be very sensitive and listen precisely to what the person has to say uh, on the other end of that camera because uh, you need to know and listen so carefully that you'll be able to come up with uh, follow-up questions that um, that, that, that you might, in other words, if you didn't ask the follow-up question, you might miss some information or some news that, uh, that just on the surface uh, you, you have. So it's a, it's a very important thing to do your research, to learn about the person you're going to interview, uh, to uh, get at the information that is not generally out there in the public domain, which is which we call news. Uh, otherwise, you just simply play into the hands of the person that uh, you're interviewing, uh, because all that person is going to do is try to get his message across, and uh, you don't get what you really want to know about, and that's the inside or scoop or the skivvy on, on what the, the, the person or people uh, are really all about. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you be paranoid and think that somebody is not uh, what he seems to be, but that's the job of a reporter to really get at uh, what you're uh, trying to achieve. So be sensitive, uh, be aware, listen carefully in doing an interview, ask uh, smart follow-up questions, and uh, you'll be served well. Uh, I think that's about uh, all I have to say, except um, what, if you're interested in knowing uh, a little bit more, why don't you just uh, throw some questions at me, and I'd be glad to, glad to try to answer. Just to piggyback back on what Ed said, um, as far as being, you know, doing your research when you're you know, doing interviews, what separates good reporters from excellent reporters is being able to listen. A lot of new reporters in the biz, they want to talk, 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 and they want to be on camera, and they want people to hear what they have to say. But what you really need to do is listen when you're in that interview, because you may go into an interview and think, okay, I've done my research, this is the story I have in mind, this is the angle I'm going to hit them with. And then when you get there, and you start listening to what they have to say, you might find out, oh, wow. He just told me something I really didn't even know about. I, I didn't even think it would go there. There's something to that. And they talk. And so be very keen when you're listening because they may have a different story, maybe one that's even more newsworthy, newsworthy than you would even set out to get. And that was just by listening. Um, so if I could uh, give you any recommendation, uh, well, one recommendation it would be to really listen when you're doing interviews. Yep. It's terribly important that you, uh, that you have an in the person or, or the people you're interviewing and listen uh, carefully to what they have to say 
so that you don't, you know, almost every story I did, somebody would lie to. And that's a sad commentary, but it's true. I, you have to be alert and aware of what somebody is saying and listen so carefully that you, that you try to uh, unmask any kind of wrongdoing that may be involved there. Okay. Uh, about anything that I said here uh, this morning or any other question you have about uh, television broadcasting, why don't you throw some questions at me? I'll try to answer. Anybody have any questions? Uh, who, how many of you? Yeah. I'll leave off then. Um, considering some of your assignments in Saigon and even nice Contra Fair, I mean, were, were you ever in Iran or Nicaragua? And did you ever feel that you were threatened or that your life was in danger? And, you know, because Rich and I were talking about um, Bob Woodruff uh, the other day. Did, did you ever have any experiences where you felt nervous at any point? Uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. I was in Vietnam, of course, for 13 months, and I was a combat correspondent, so went out in the field and, and to, I, my view is that any good reporter, anybody worth his salt, has to put himself in harm's way uh, for the sake of, the, of his audience, or his viewer, or his reader. In other words, uh, you, have, you can't hang back. You've got to be able to to uh, be bold and aggressive in what you're reporting, and so that means you go, you've got to go to the front lines. You can't uh, do the story from a bar in uh, Saigon. You have to go out and, and be out there. The same was true during the Sandinista revolution against uh, Anastasio Somoza, the dictator in Nicaragua, uh, where we went out with the camera crew to uh, Masaya where the National Guardsmen for Samosa were uh, taking young people your age, jerking them out of their houses and executing them in front of our cameras, point blank. And they, uh, but these soldiers didn't, uh, didn't discriminate. But they looked at us as being the enemy as well, and so we came under fire a number of times in, in Messiah and, and elsewhere in Nicaragua during that revolution. And that is, uh, my, my, good, my friend, um, Bill Lawrence of ABC News, uh, was a victim of that, that kind of that syndrome because he was covering the war and uh, he and his camera crew approached a checkpoint, a uh, National Guard checkpoint, uh, to try to uh, get permission to film something or videotape it a bit. Uh, and he approached the uh, outpost, and he approached the guardsman with a white flag in one hand and his uh, credentials in the other. And the guardsman forced him to go down on his knees, and then he forced him to lay flat on the road, and then the guardsman took aim with the rifle and shot him dead in the back of the ear. Uh, so it's a very dangerous business that, uh, that in which you encounter those those kinds of things, where your anonymity, your anonymity as a reporter, is um, is something that, in other words, the guardsmen or the police or the soldiers don't know who you are or what you are. They don't care. They, in many cases, it's a, to their advantage to stop information from getting out. So. The, they have tried to thwart you in, in whatever your job is, and you, so it's an adversarial kind of thing all the time between authority and you, the reporter. Does that answer your question? Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. Question. Um, with the transformation of technology, uh, did your role as a reporter change and transform over time as well? Like, did you have to shoot your own stuff or edit your own stuff? As Good, good question. Uh, we used to go out in the field with a, a cameraman, a sound technician, a light technician, and maybe a producer. And that's a lot of people uh, out in the field. And one of the reasons for that, uh, the advance, you could be the camera person, you could be the light person, you could be the sound technician, all and the producer, all rolled into one. So you became what is called the one-man band. 
one man band, and very inexpensive to, to do that that way, as opposed to hauling five people around on an airplane or uh, in rented cars and so on. You're by yourself, you're on your own, and you, and you carry out all of those functions. In fact, I'm sure Bridget will tell you that you, she went out in the field and recorded the story, or had the story recorded for her, but then she would write it, and she would produce it, and she would get it on the air on her own. And, and so the technology freed up uh, and, and meant the loss of employment by a lot of people because one person now, the reporter, uh, can do it all. And so I think that that is the most significant part uh, as far as the relationship between uh, the reporters and producers and, and what they used to do and, and what it can be done now by one person. It's, it's just amazing what the technology has afforded them to do. Any other questions here? Um, I, I would think that um, any of you who are looking to try to get uh, a job in uh, television or radio broadcasting or whatever might, uh, might want to know something uh, more than I've been able to do. about headlines? I know you and I were talking about that earlier, about your example in South Carolina. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that uh, comes up time after time by the, uh, those who are not uh, too familiar with what we do is <coughs> how you use the images that are produced by the camera and how you relate those things to what you are doing as, as a reporter in terms of what you write and how you transmit uh, information to your viewer. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sophisticated thing in which you use, the, the images are telling the viewer one thing and then you're telling them something else to enhance, hopefully, uh, what, what the images are saying. We used to have a saying in, uh, at uh, Sunday morning with uh, Charles Giralt, which afforded or allowed us to have more time to tell stories. We used to say we were shooting for a zero-based narration because the images were so terribly important. <coughs> but if you can uh, think in terms of uh, being able to give the viewer uh, even better understanding than the images do, then you're well served. For example, uh, in, uh, I was doing a story once on a hurricane coming toward the shore in uh, South Carolina, and there are barrier islands uh, that um, uh, are out there just beyond the main landfall uh, that, um, that many of you may, or some of you may have already seen these barrier islands. Uh, one of them is Kiowa Island, another is, uh, well, there are a number of of islands out there that, are, uh, that the ocean comes up against and, and it's a barrier to, to anything uh, on the mainland. So what I said at the lead of the story, and we had pictures of these barrier islands and the hurricane approaching, I said that um, the barrier islands of South Carolina are no barrier to hurricane, what it mean, hurricane islands. And <clears throat> so it was a hit and run uh, proposition in which you state the nature of the story that you're about to tell the viewers right at the top and then you allow the images to roll and you are able to virtually say anything you want to say at, at that point. But it's, it's a very uh, sophisticated technique in which you don't simply give a bottom line or a, uh, you don't have a caption for each picture that is out there, but the pictures tell one story and you tell the other, and that's, that <clears throat> theoretically should give the viewer a great, a greater sense of, uh, of what has happened. Yes, anybody else have a question? <coughs> Who wants to go into broadcasting? And why do you want to do that, I guess is the question. And, and what do you hope for, and what do you, how do you see yourself achieving that? And what many would call a dream. What is it that you want to do? Tell me what you want to do. I'm hoping to um, maybe be a reporter for the National News because uh, I worked uh, at WSAZ here in Charleston for a little while and I really didn't want to do anything with that but after being there and seeing it and getting the feel for everything it makes me really want to go and do something like that.
What is it specifically that you saw with your time there that uh, prompted you to want to go into and in, become what a reporter? You think you would want to be on air? First? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was a photographer, so I was going out and filming and interviewing and everything like that, and it was great getting out on the field and learning the, all these new things and. I don't know, it was just, it's just something that like I've never experienced before and I, I really enjoyed my time working there. So I'm hoping that I can further myself into something like that. And what do you think you're going to have to do to achieve that? Well, I know I'm going to have to work really hard at it. I feel like it's one of those things that you start out somewhere low and then you just work your way up. It's a lot of hard work. It is much, to, and you're right, it's much different today than it was 50 years ago when I became the news director of Channel 8 WCHS TV here in Charleston. And uh, that was a CBS affiliate. And I did stories about uh, the anti poverty, the war on poverty here at that time. And that attracted the attention of, of um, people at CBS News in New York, and I was hired directly from here to be a reporter on air, uh, based in New York and then all over the world. That doesn't happen that easily anymore. You have to really work your way up in most cases. Not only do you have to work hard and work your way up, but if you also, as I pointed out in a little talk, uh, you have to really be an attractive person. So you have to combine all of these things in order to, to achieve your dream. It's very lucrative at the top, but there are very few of those uh, jobs at the very top. So it's a hard thing to break into, to, to become, uh, if you will, a top line reporter. But even at local stations, uh, the pay can be uh, pretty good. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a very, it's a legitimate and honorable thing to want to become a reporter. Yes. Yes. To piggyback on that, they're pretty well versed with DNAs and things like that. But I find that that's really rare and impressive that someone is hired from what I don't know what market. It was probably larger back then because Charleston's actually declined in population over the last few years. Right. But now we're somewhere around the 67 or 68 market, I think. I mean, we're on 55 back when I. Yeah, I thought, yeah. And so I, we we talked about how you eventually have to love the system and that's one of the, the pluses as far as media conglomerates and that like Sinclair Sinclair, owns Sinclair owns CHS. Channel, right. and then there's Cox and then there's Tribune and that's one of the benefits of having conglomerates so you can kind of move your way um, you know I've had friends that continued on their careers in broadcast journalism and you know started out in New Orleans shortly after school and then moved their way up to Washington DC and now he's in San Francisco which I think is a four or five market um, so they're pretty well versed with that, but that's, you, yeah, you're right, you don't see that any, anymore, moving up from the market to the 50s and 60s all the way up. You know, they want you to have that top 10 market experience before you go work for the networks. I that's assume, it, right? That's exactly right, and you have to remember that back when I, I started out in the 60s, uh, the CBS Evening News was presented in a 15-minute block in black and white. And I, I know you can't imagine how that was. It was long before you were born. But it was black and white, and I think it was a guy by the name of Swayze who was the anchor person on uh, that black and white evening news broadcast. Then CBS and Bill Paley, who owned the place and operated it, uh, decided that <clears throat> this was an important aspect of what his network, CBS, was doing. In other words, he made tons of money on the entertainment side of the business, but uh, the only thing that you could really produce on your own at a network, because it was mandated this way, in other words, you bought all your entertainment programs from Hollywood, the only thing that the networks really did on their own was the news and specials and documentaries and, and things like that. And Paley really wanted him, him, uh, his network to shine, so he hired people like Ed Murrow and Walter Cronkite and all those other names that are icons, you know, that are really uh, extraordinary in our mind, in our memories. He hired all those people and he expanded the news division tremendously. Uh, 
in the 60s and started uh, 60 Minutes at that time with Mike Wallace and all those uh, very memorable people. And he did that because he wanted to make it into what is what became known as the Tiffany Network. It was uh, an extraordinary thing. And so when he expanded the news division, Walter Cronkite became the anchor man, and the half hour was, they began broadcasting it in living color, believe it or not. Uh, you take that for granted now, but it wasn't that it wasn't so all, it, it, in the past. And it was a half hour, and they began hiring a lot of reporters. And I was uh, among those who had the good fortune of being in the right place at the right time to to be able to hi be hired by by uh, CBS, by the, the deep big major network competing in the news business. Back then it was Walter Cronkite, and on the other side of the fence was <coughs> Huntley Brinkley, the Huntley Brinkley Report. Uh, those, those things may not be familiar to you, but they are images, they are reminders to me very vividly as if it ha it, it, what happened occurred just yesterday. And so this, uh, this incredible move from that old technology and the old ways of doing things on television, which were brand new at the time. I mean, 60 Minutes was an innovation that out of this world, uh, because 60 Minutes uh, presented a whole new format or way of telling stories on television. And, and the people, primarily, those stories today that you see on 60 Minutes, if you ever look at that broadcast, you will see that most of those stories are not uh, are, are presented by doing uh, good interviews with one or two people. And they shoot the, these people very close up on their faces. And that's done for a purpose because people have, are riveting to us. We identify with, with people we see on television. <clears throat> and nobody with a bland personality or, or way of expressing himself is going to get on 60 Minutes because it doesn't work for the television audience. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Okay. Uh, any other questions, please? I really would like to know. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. I'm going to ask what you say about that they, they mandate what you can wear. Uh, then like, when you go out, they also like, what kind of take on the story? No, you know, that's a good point. I mean, as far as I was concerned, they, I would, they never, and, and that's a really important question. You ask. They, the, my superiors at CBS and then NBC, uh, I was with CBS for 20 years and then NBC for 13 years, four of those years as the national security correspondent at the Pentagon. But uh, they, my superiors never intervened, never, not one time intervened in terms of uh, the angle of a story or the editorial nature of a story. And uh, I think that that was extraordinary. I'm not sure that I can say that for every broadcast entity or every network. I, I'm not sure. But I think one thing that you have to keep in mind, it's a very subtle thing. It's not so subtle, but it is, it's important. If you watch the broadcasts these days, especially in local markets like Charleston and Huntington and in the market you serve in, the, your superiors are saying to you, let's do stories about the weather. Let's do fender bender stories. Let's do house fire stories. But they are not saying to you, let's investigate what uh, Don Blankenship did at the Big Branch coal mine in which 29 miners were killed. Those stories, I think, are off limits to reporters these days. And so it's a subtle thing in which uh, the your superiors are not directly intervening in a story that you may have done, which is controversial, but they are limiting you to the stories that can be told without significance. And that's unfortunate because um, you, the audience is not well served by just mediocre stories being presented all the time. Uh, they're not served by the fact that television stations don't want to spend a lot of money on the news, but they make a lot of money on the news. That's why they do the cosmetic aspect of it. That's why uh, they, they, you know, the helicopters they use, they, the helicopters become the star of the evening newscast as opposed to whatever they're videotaping or whatever. They, they promote the, the helicopter. They, 
And, uh, you know, uh, Channel 3 here, the uh, SAC, has a slogan in which they say, breaking news, our commitment to you. Well, they have no commitment to anybody because the breaking news that they present is sometimes uh, the most ludicrous thing. I mean, the, the everyday pedestrian kinds of things that are presented on the local news. I know I'm being hard on them, but believe me, it's, it's, a, it's a sad thing. So you have to, if you're going into the business, you have to question just what you'll be doing, especially at a local level where television station managers and owners and operators don't want to offend the government leaders and others who, can, who may or may not control the revenue that comes into the television station. In other words, you're not going to criticize a, uh, you have to be independent, the station does. And I don't mean independence in terms of network affiliation. I mean, you have to be independent and willing to take, have the courage to take on the big issues of the day and the big people of the day. You have to be able to, you have to be willing to want to do that. And that that's something that, that you know, there's a great lack of courage there, it seems to me, when it comes to, especially local. Those institutions, local institutions, local broadcasters are just as much an institution within uh, the communities as, as government, as, as anything else. And so, uh, but at the same time, they are, if they're not courageous, they come under the influence of and, and are subjected to a kind of leveling of uh, what they can do because of the fear that, uh, that they have that their revenues are going to be cut off, that their advertisers will stop advertising, that government leaders will come down hard on them. Uh, it, and it's a tough thing to, to stand up against. So be careful about that as you go forward to try to get a job in, in the business. Yeah, we're there, aren't we? I just have one last question because I'm, I'm fascinated by the CBS news. I mean, all my I've showed in the mark in all my classes. I'm, oh, good. I, I, good. I played with our Murrows. But I'm curious, as far as uh, was there anyone during your formative years at CBS, uh, you know, Schiffer, um, uh, Bradley, any of those guys? I mean, you mentioned Corral, but Andy Rooney. I mean, how, how much you know did you have as far as like your working relations with people? Like, that's someone that took you under your yeah. That's, that's a, a good question, and I'll tell you this, I found myself in really good company with the Walter Cronkites of the world, the Charles Gerolds. I didn't know Ed Murrow, but uh, certainly the tradition of Murrow in that, in the, at CBS. Um, and then there are producers who are behind the cameras that you never hear about, but who influenced me a great deal. One of them was Shad Northshield, who was the executive producer of the CBS Sunday Morning with Charles Grewal, he had a great influence on me. So did a guy by the name of Jim Boutridis, who was my own personal producer, who um, <clears throat> uh, was was very influential in, in terms of uh, giving me tips on how, how to write and those, some of those things that I've been talking to the class about. So, yes, uh, the answer is, uh, all of the people you spoke of, I, except for Murrow, I knew personally, and all of them had an impact, if not directly, at least in how they presented themselves on television and how they wrote and how they uh, were able to deal with, with the complexities of presenting a story on television. Uh, and I understood, just simply working within the business, and that I was influenced by their, uh, the way they did things, and, how I could do something akin to that. So that was a really important uh, time. Well, I guess we're out of time. So thanks very much for listening to me. And uh, I, hope, uh, I wish you the best in, in uh, whatever endeavor you had, especially in uh, television, radio, and cable, and internet, and all the other fountains of information that are uh, open to you and available. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.